know, in the church we have three truly big days, the first and second, of course, being Christmas and Easter, and the third major day is the very birthday of the church, Pentecost Sunday, that we celebrate today. And the word Pentecost in ancient Greek simply means the 50th day, and there are 50 days between Easter and Pentecost. And it's the day when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and Mary in that upper room, the very same upper room where Christ had offered and celebrated the Last Supper. The apostles were cowering in that room. They were fearful of what they thought would happen to them. They were confused by the downward spiraling events ever since Palm Sunday, and they were completely unsure of what to do next. Yes, Jesus had promised to send the Spirit, the Advocate, as he told them, but they did not know what that truly meant. Christ had given them a very serious mission on that Ascension Thursday to go and teach all nations and to baptize. But how? What exactly were they supposed to do? Would they be safe? Would they even get out of that upper room alive? And in a flash, the church was born. Yes, Jesus had already appointed his 12 apostles as the first leaders of his church that we now call bishops, but they had no confidence. They had no words, and there were language issues. And oddly enough, that reminds me of a funny story. There was a judge in a small county who was presiding over a case where the defendant was accused of assaulting a police officer. And to convict the defendant, the district attorney had to show that the defendant knew that the person that he was assaulting was in fact a police officer. And of course, the easiest way to do that was to show that the, police off the gentleman was actually wearing a police uniform. And so the district attorney asked the police officer on the witness stand, and how were you attired when you pulled over the defendant? Well, the witness looked at him blankly. Would you repeat that question again, please? Slightly irritated, the district attorney said, and how were you attired when you pulled over the defendant? The witness was still puzzled. Say that again, he pleaded. How were you attired when you pulled over the defendant, barked the district attorney. Well, the light bulb finally went off in the police officer's head and he proudly proclaimed, my police car was equipped with radial tires. <laughs> there was a language problem there, you see that? <clears throat> Well, the apostles' lack of courage and confusion over what to do next and how to carry out their mission all changed in an instant. Just as Jesus had promised, after he had ascended to the Father, the Spirit was then sent to teach and to guide them. You see, when Christ established his church on earth through his apostles, he didn't tell them to go out and build buildings that were going to be his churches throughout the world. He instructed them and gave them very specific mission to go and teach the world about him. He taught them day in and day out for three long years. He taught by word and by his actions. His desire was that all people everywhere would come to know about his and his father's love for all mankind. He knew that he couldn't be among us in the flesh forever. And so he established his church, the people of God the one body of Christ on earth. And he did so with the fervent hope that we would want to do everything in our power to live with them for all eternity because we would grow in love for him and for the Father. Christ established the church on earth to unify us. And today we still see examples of how that occurs. Recall, if you will, the funeral of Pope St. John Paul II more than 3,000 foreign journalists descended upon Rome as the Pope was dying. Worldwide media attention gave round-the-clock coverage to viewers all across the globe. And during the week before the funeral, two million pilgrims, mostly young people from all five continents, paid their last respects in person to the Pope as he lay in state. The funeral was watched and heard by millions all over television and radio. And world leaders who came included four queens and five kings, 70 prime ministers or heads of government, and more than 100 other recognized dignitaries. Dozens of Orthodox, Protestant, and Jewish leaders also joined them. The death of that great man seemed to unite people throughout the entire world. 
it looked and it sounded like that first Pentecost. Because through his church, a divided world was again being made into one family. The unifying nature of the church is even symbolized in the architecture of St. Peter's Square in Rome. Almost 100,000 people can fit inside that plaza, which is about three football fields wide. And if you look down at the plaza from the top of St. Peter's Basilica, you see the curved lines with those 350 columns. They surround the oval plaza, and they look like huge arms spread out in welcome. And the great artist Bernini, who designed the plaza, described it as a symbol of the maternal arms of Mother Church. Those arms have welcomed pilgrims from every continent, every age group, and every walk of life for the past 500 years. Every Wednesday alone, when the weather permits, there's a papal audience that averages 20,000 pilgrims. Bringing unity to a divided family is the work of the church. And that began on Pentecost. Pope Francis himself continues Christ's unifying work today as we see. We see it in how he is trying to draw more people back to the church. We saw it recently when he met with leaders of other faiths in the Holy Land. And I contend that we're going to see it as he continues to work to draw the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches back together after a centuries-old schism. That's the church on earth. It's the Pope the bishops, the priests, the deacons, all of you, and all of God's faithful throughout the world. We celebrate our communal birthday today and every year on Pentecost Sunday. But is that it? Is this a day in the church that we celebrate simply to remember how the church came to be? Well, that of course is a big part of it, but we also play a very big part in the ongoing unifying work of the church. Pope St. Gregory the Great once said, the love of God inspires the love of our neighbor, and the love of our neighbor serves to keep alive the love of God. By, allowing one, by loving one another, we help to do the work of the church by inspiring others to love, which in turn reminds all of us of the love that God has for each one of us. It unifies us into the one body of Christ, the church. The famous Renaissance scholar Erasmus once told this classic story where Jesus returns to heaven after his time on earth and the angels are all gathered around him to learn about what he did while he was on earth and everything that happened. And Jesus, of course, tells them of his miracles, of his teachings, his unfortunate death on the cross, and his resurrection. And when he finishes the story, Michael the archangel asks Jesus, but what happens now? And Jesus answered, well, I've left behind 11 faithful disciples and a handful of men and women who have faithfully followed me. They will declare my message and they will express my love. These faithful people will build my church. But, responds Michael, what if these people fail? What then is your other plan? And Jesus answers, I have no other plan. You see, folks, Jesus is counting on you, and he's counting on me. We are now Christ's eyes and ears and hands and feet. But the good news is that we're not alone. The Holy Spirit continues to be with us, to encourage and to strengthen us, to guide us, and to use us to continue to build the one body of Christ on earth. You see, that gift that we received on the church's birthday on that first Pentecost, is truly a gift that keeps on giving.